Welcome to the IBM Podcast Network. Hello, you're listening to the Pragati Podcast with me, Hamsini Hariharan. Every fortnight, I sit down with my co-host, Pavan Srinath, to try and make sense of what's happening in politics, policy and economics. So in the first half, Pavan and I will be discussing how we should think of political labels, left versus right, conservative versus liberal and so on. In the second half of the show, Pavan sits down with our editor, Amit Varma, and Ramesh Nam, a renowned futurist, a computer scientist and an award-winning author, to talk about the future of energy. So in these polarized times, political labels mean everything. It is now more important than ever to know what your political identity is. So Pavan, you tell me, are you left? Are you right? <laughs> I'm really hoping that I'm not wrong. <laughs> You know, so one of the things that is happening nowadays is people are fixating far too much on these labels. And beyond a point, they don't really make sense to me. So you have someone who is economic conservative, but can be liberal on economic freedoms at the same time. When people say that they're conservative, does it mean that government should be conservative in what they intervene in? Or should we be conservative in changing public policy? Right? Or do you make only incremental changes or big changes? So I'm always lost in this conversation. Okay, so let's place it in a larger global context, right? I mean, if you look at regimes around the world, countries around the world. You have La Pen in France, you have our favorite person, Donald Trump in the US. And we're talking about people who are thought to be conservative, but conservative in what sense? They're thought to be right, far right. I mean, those are the labels I've seen, uh, seen used. I don't know if Donald Trump can be considered a conservative in, in, in any technical sense, you know, but you do paint them as right or far right. Okay, okay, one second. We're going to take a break. Okay. Conservative means what? Economically? What does it mean? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's then take several steps back. Okay. So typically when we talk about the political spectrum, um, people think of it as sort of one line that goes from an extreme left on one side and an extreme right on one. So a scale. Yeah, a scale of some sort. But even when you say the word political spectrum, uh, spectrum from physics is when you take light and then you disperse it along something, right? So you take uh, the sun's incoming radiation and you disperse it along frequency, for example. So if you disperse it along frequency, you have all the way from sort of gamma rays and x-rays on one side, really high energy, intense stuff, all the way to visible light somewhere in the middle, to radio waves and other things, which are very fairly harmless. You know, that's why they can uh, travel distances and we can hear radio uh, without that radiation damaging us in any big way, right? So you have that being the spectrum and the purpose of dispersing a spectrum is to be able to study it better. The first problem I have uh, right now is that people are using this political spectrum to pigeonhole people and bucket them so that they can sort of explain them away in whatever ways they want. What are you saying? The easiest thing for me to do when you suggest anything is say you rightist anti-national person. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Rightist anti-national. I love that combination. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that that's what it's been used for. But the highest form of its utility is that you can understand how they're different from each other. Now, the important thing is you want to disperse people along an axis where there's a lot of differences. In the US, for example, while there is the stock of left and right, by and large, when you see uh, sort of political beliefs and ideology and so on, uh, people disperse them along two axes. You know, there's an X and a Y. And typically one axis of the, on that is your views on economic freedom. You know, do you want society to make more free economic choices versus less free versus personal freedoms, right? Where uh, you have, you know, the state telling you what you can and cannot do in your bedroom, whom you can marry, what you can do with your life. And on the other hand, where you're allowed to do whatever you want to, so long as you're consult consenting adults in the process, right? So when you do this in the US, you get, you know, libertarian on one side, those who believe in both freedoms. Uh, you have a conservative, which is they want economic freedoms, but not so much on the social freedom side. Then you have the Democrats who are sort of left liberal equivalent in India, which is more like you want personal freedoms a lot, but economic freedoms, the state can intervene and tell businesses what they can, can and can't do. And then you have authoritarian on the final corner, right? Where the 
state, the government, the grand pooba gets to decide what's best for the country in almost everything. Okay, so this seems like a fair scale. Why can't we use it in India? The problem in India is that we are not very different on this scale. I mean, the old joke is that the BJP is Congress with a cow. you know so on a lot of freedoms on a lot of you know whether you should allow um ease of do- doing business to be more whether you should allow businesses to be able to function more freely uh whether markets should be tightly regulated or loosely regulated by and large indian political parties have a broad consensus of somewhere in the middle to somewhere towards very little freedoms for example the modi government is thinking of price caps on everything from short distance airline tickets to a uh, coronary stents coronary stents yes so turns out that these stents are expensive as they will be because you know it takes a lot of technology and uh, therefore they are very expensive and oh wait but where does all of this you know the price caps and so on put the modi government on your political identity scale that's my uh, point right so you have the modi government doing two price caps over here and price cap is only one type of a government intervention that restricts business freedoms you have the karnataka congress government with mr sidramaiah trying the same thing with uh, multiplex movie ticket prices which is an idea that either the dmk or the admk government in tamil nadu started donkeys years ago right so you have sort of the same economic ideas that are there in pretty much every single party and from time to time there are people individuals moments and parties who try to push the consensus and do something a little more free so but the point is on economic freedom the people are not very different even on something like personal freedom we can say that almost every political party has been guilty of abridging personal freedoms when they have been in power right and when they go into the opposition they raise a hue and cry so i'm not trying to say that people are all hypocrites here or people are all the same but what this means is our conventional axes of dispersing people along economic and personal freedoms will not give us enough distinction between political parties politicians and individuals in the country But you say that's because Indian politics is more fluid because it's a lot more issue based. Because a party might be more free on a particular thing, but they might be averse to say a uniform civil code, right? True. Uh, I would interpret that as issue based in that it's not a principle of economic freedom that is sort of uh, respected through all decisions. But you know, whatever happens, however you want to manage the the crisis or the the problem it gets managed in some way uh, but more importantly and i think this is a point that pratap banu mehta has brought out in the past is that the problem in india is consensus we all sort of think that you know these are the labor laws that we can manage and we can't really improve them much we sort of know that okay these are the uh, land uh, acquisition acts that we have and by and large even if you look at the jairam ramesh version of the land acquisition act and the uh, modi government version they're not fundamentally different the, the premise is by and large the same so basically how do you identify difference in a meaningful way and how do you tie it to something coherent Nitin Pai proposes something called the Niti Mandala, where he chooses two different axes to disperse people on, and this is very interesting. So, to him, the two axes are identity and some form of freedom as a whole, adding all the various types of freedoms. So, if you look at identity and you look at Indian political parties, a lot of people care about one caste, a lot of political parties care about one state or one language. or one community right so the locus of identity that this party or this uh, ideology caters to is that small and in india also has a communist party which at least was, at one point ha- had a global vision right the idea of is that workers It's around the world unite right? right you don't care about national boundaries you don't care about nationalism so much but you care about uh, workers rights across the world right which is controversially a liberal idea <laughs> uh in a way but uh, the liberal idea is always a focus on individual liberty fair enough so in a sense you know uh, if you lo- talking about liberals you can bucket them as they only care about the individual no- not any group identity but by virtue of caring about the individual and considering that all individuals are equal there's a universal humanist global identity that they sort of look at as well 
right so you have a wide spectrum on that then you have the nationalists in the middle you have uh, hindu nationalists who form a subset right where they want great stuff for hindu nationalists only right so if you don't acknowledge your um, civilizational identity so so to speak then you are not necessarily a welcome member in that in that grouping I totally acknowledge my civilization identity. Yeah, you're wearing a sari today. <laughs> but uh, my question is so you're saying instead of looking at things like oh I'm center right or I'm center left it would be better to think of myself as maybe I'm a liberal nationalist or maybe That's I'm... right. That's right. So you can now look at the liberty axis separately and the identity axis separately. So if you were someone who uh, didn't care much for freedoms and you had a fairly narrow identity maybe you can be uh, labeled as a parochialist you know if a label is what we are looking for but the attitude would be parochial in nature fair enough i'm going to take the conversation a little away to something that's happening so the french elections notwithstanding of the outcome i'm wondering about the debates that we are using to analyze the french elections so uh, le pen for example after uh, she advanced to the second round announced that she was going to be stepping down from the leadership of the national front which is interesting because a lot of people were saying that this is because she doesn't want to be seen as extremely right which is how she is conventionally described what do you think of that i think marie le pen and populists of various sorts are very hard to classify in any of these political spectrums because they are in a sense denying the spectrum denying that space altogether denying legitimacy to anyone who is not them right like i don't think you can realistic put donald trump on a map on any axis because the guy is saying something different every single day right and a lot of demagoguery is focused on raising fears of various types so let me uh, give you one example where sort of the conventional left and the conventional right end up sort of meaning and saying the same things but coming from different angles and this is the topic of immigration okay so if you look at Trump uh, in America or Marie Le Pen in uh, France they're talking about how immigrants are coming and taking away the local culture they're talking about how immigrants are taking away jobs and also adding to economic insecurity and saying that people who have not been able to improve their economic lot in the last few decades are kept there because of evil immigrants you know so they raise the demon of evil immigrants on one side this is the sort of the rightist argument on this but coming from the left you've always had restrictions on mobility coming from the angle that immigrant labor is typically exploited it's you know the exploitative. laws <laughs> exploitative and you know the laws governing them are uh, sort of not perfect and therefore all of this is happening right so the american uh, democratic core base for the longest time were people who were very afraid of jobs being lost to bangalore you know uh, jobs moving out of the country it was coming from an economic security angle so if you're in the working class and your job is under threat the government must step in to help the right wing argument is look your jobs are under threat there are these people who are coming and taking them away so we will step in to stop them from doing so the outcome is the same sort of the logic is more or less the same uh, you demonize based on cl- class or you demonize based on ethnicity and one is considered left one is considered right you know but so by it's the narrative that matters and not the political often identity. because the fear maybe you can say one fear is a little more economic one fear is a little more ethnic yeah because eth- an ethnic narrative is always easy to play out it's attractive correct true but in a largely homogenous society class narratives also play out i mean the flavor of the moment are ethnic flavors right i mean people talking about one nationality was another one close grouping versus another but the idea of rich versus poor versus middle class the class warfare thing has been going on since marx and before right the narratives have been popular and you do dub people as elite even the right wing uh, paints a bad picture of the ossified elite 
right uh, going back to um, revolutionary france where even the left and right came about into lexicon people who sat on the right were people who supported the monarchy supported the ancien regime people who sat on the left were everyone who opposed it right so you, again that's a bizarre difference you had everyone from anarchists to, to capitalists to socialists who all sat on the left uh, and so i'm sure there were some extremely a pitiable directionally challenged people sitting at the center not knowing which side that they were actually on well <laughs> i'm sure that's true right so that sort of where different people have come into this from and therefore it's important for us to recognize what are the attributes that make up a political identity uh, typically every ideology has a fear of some sort has a um a change framework for the world so for example the classic social conservative argument uh, is that their fear is that societies are inherently very fragile so if you try to muck around too much if you try to change too much then that can lead to uh, social disorder and anarchy and their thing is we can't have anarchy anarchy is worse than whatever is the current status quo so don't change things too quickly right? that's perhaps the best form of the argument for a social conservative and they will say that they will have a theory of how the world can change and give us development all ideologies want progress want improvement sometimes they want an improvement because it's a return to a glorious past sometimes they want an improvement saying it's an escape from the terrible past into a glorious future but everyone wants to promise you good things in the future right there so uh, i think it's important for us to get out of this labeling business and look at what do you fear what is your hope what is your theory of change and then apply reason logic evidence and other things to those ideologies hello listeners my name is munaf kapadia and i am nabil merchant we are the co-hosts of the show my neighbor zuckerberg on the show we invite ordinary people who have extraordinary stories to share tales of creativity persistence and struggle We call them entrepreneurs. Tune in every Monday to listen to their journeys. We are available on iTunes, Audio Boom, and the IVM Podcast app. Welcome back to the Pragati Podcast. I'm Pavan Srinath, and I'm Amit Verma. What's up, India? How you doing? Amit, you look very, very full of energy today. Here's an interesting thing, Pavan. Yesterday, I was pretty low on energy. You could say I was having energy crisis. But then I met up with a friend who changed the way I look at the world. I instantly went outdoors and soaked up the sun, and now I'm full of beans. Coffee beans? Some of them. <laughs> so, let me just to get serious. I'm very excited about the guests we have on the show today. Ramesh Nam, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Great to be here. Ramis is a renowned futurist. He's an award-winning science fiction author. You should check out his Nexus trilogy if you haven't already. And just Google him and read some of his writings on artificial intelligence and the subject we are talking about today, energy. Now people keep talking about an energy crisis, and Ramis always tells them to just chill in more ways than one. Ramis, what makes you so optimistic, man? Well, we're seeing exponential technology come to energy. We've seen for decades Moore's law in computing. Computing gets exponentially cheaper and more powerful. That's why we have smartphones today that are like supercomputers in our pockets, and we're seeing something similar happen in energy, particularly in solar power and in batteries. Technology has always grown cheaper, but that's not really the case with energy, right? So, what makes it different now? I mean. That's right. Energy prices historically have fluctuated. Over time they slowly go down, but when you're dealing with the price of extracting something from the ground and then the pockets of coal or oil are running out even as your extraction technology is getting better, you're sort of in this race. But with technology, the technology is just always getting better. It's always getting cheaper. TVs always get cheaper. Phones always get cheaper. Go to the capabilities. Computers always get cheaper. And so now that is happening in things like solar and batteries, where we are uh, producing energy directly through technology rather than by burning some old plants and dinosaurs. And is this really going to be enough to solve our energy problems? Like. you know and what impact does this have on global warming for example well it's a huge impact so first the amount of energy we have on the planet is enormous if the sun hits the planet with about 10,000 times more energy every hour than all of human civilization uses right so we have a 
very little of it do we capture effectively. So there's more than enough. The problem has been that it's been too expensive to capture it with things like solar panels or wind power. But now that the price is coming down, it opens the possibility to bringing more energy to the people of the world, especially people in places like India, where there's a lot of sunlight, at a lower cost, finishing electrification and doing so in a clean way that doesn't produce air pollution or smog or climate change. So are we sort of reaching the point in the growth of technology when it becomes a no-brainer for governments to just look at, for example, solar energy as a main source of power generation rather than whatever else? We're hitting those tipping points. Something very important happened in India just last month. There was a, a new uh, solar power plant, uh, the Rewa Ultra uh, Solar Power Plant, 750 megawatts. That's a very large solar power plant. This is not uh, a one home or a village. It's this power output of a coal power plant. And when the auction for that happened, when people put in their bids, the lowest bid was just below three rupees per unit, three rupees per kilowatt hour. And the price of coal electricity in India for a new coal plant is like 3.1 rupees per kilowatt hour. So now, for the first time, we see this happening, that solar power is now cheaper than coal in India. And if you look back, the price has dropped by about a factor of five over the last 10 years. Now, it probably won't drop quite that fast in the future, but from this year forward, solar will keep getting cheaper, and the gulf between it and coal or natural gas will get larger and larger. So for building new power plants, solar is now going to become the most logical thing to do in most areas of India. So, so long as battery technology also improves at the same pace, then coal is history? That's right. Yeah. So it it is a challenge that we have, which is that we have to provide power when the sun isn't shining and when the wind isn't blowing. So solar and wind are usually complementary. The wind uh, blows 24-7, but mostly more at night, typically. Sun, of course, during the day. And typically the winter has more wind and the summer has more sun. So you put them together, you can get maybe 70% of the power needs of a continent or subcontinent. But to get beyond that, you have to get to some storage or some nuclear power plants or some natural gas or coal plants still operating. But we have a very long way to go before we hit the limits of storage or even needing storage, to be honest. Okay. So in this, one of my questions has always been, we have seen technological innovation happen even with, say, um, the technologies around oil, right? The, yes. the, the shale revolution that's happened in the last decade. But are you arguing that the changes that we are seeing in solar power uh, generation and in wind power are much different and maybe at a, the technological innovation is happening at a much larger scale than with something like what happened with shale? Yeah, so it's different in two ways. One is how fast is the pace of innovation? So talk about the learning rate of a technology. And you can formalize it as for every doubling of the size of an industry, Mm -hmm. how much does the price drop? And in uh, shale drilling, it's substantial. It's maybe 7 or 10% reduction in price. But for per doubling in solar, it's like a 24 percent reduction per doubling of scale. And solar is still much newer. So that's one way. It's just numerically faster. And so it has a much longer way to go to scale. Exactly. It's a much longer way to go to scale. The other way is that when you are drilling or mining for coal, you have the technology getting better, undoubtedly. Right. At the same time, when you uh, put a wellhead in to an oil field, the pressure is at its maximum. And every day, the pressure in that oil field drops. And so you're also racing this depletion effect. So you're on a bit of a treadmill, uh, which is something that doesn't exist for solar. There's no shortage of silicon, right? We can Mm -hmm. take all the sand we want and make all the solar panels we want. There's not even much of a shortage of land. Less than a half a percent of the world's land area would suffice to meet all of our energy needs with solar. So we don't have those sort of saturation or depletion effects. So now coming to India, I mean, uh, I'm glad that you brought up an Indian example of the tipping point happening. How should India be thinking about energy? Uh, I know that uh, in the West, especially the question being asked right now is either or, right? Do we do more coal or more solar? And I think the answers are tilting more and more towards the renewables. And that's a great thing. But in India, where energy demand is rapidly growing, 
should uh, should we adopt the same strategy or uh, some of us have been batting for let's do all of it yeah. um and then figure out what works more and then we'll do more of that too yeah so india is unique of all of sort of the major powers imagine the us the eu china and india let's call say those are the four major powers in the world india is the only one that has rapidly growing electricity demand. China is still growing, but it's mm-hmm. it's slowed down a lot and it really it hasn't grown for the last 2 or 3 years it's actually shrunk a little bit. Uh, and India is also the only one that does not have near universal electrification. So India has this this moral imperative, first and foremost, to get electricity to everyone because that unlocks their potential, that lets them get a better education, that lets them be entrepreneurs, scientists, whatever. So let me never say you should stop short of anything to get power to all of the people. At the same time, uh, so that would lead you to say, let's just do all of the above. But when you build a new power plant, you are building it for a 30 or 40 year time frame. Mm-hmm. So what we see is in China now, um, two thirds of the coal plants that were planned three years ago are now no longer going to happen. And that will probably shrink. Coal plants that are running are running at far below capacity. In the U.S., a, a well-managed coal plant should run at 80%, 85% of capacity. In China, it's now below 50%, and it's heading there in India as well. So when you start talking about building this thing that will cost you you know, billions of rupees to build a coal power plant, actually tens of billions, and you want it to run for 30 or 40 years, if it's going to be decommissioned after just 10 years because solar is so cheap, you're not going to get the real economics. It's going to end up costing you much more per unit of power created than you think. So that just says from an investor mindset, whether that's the the nation or private financiers of these things, to think carefully about is this asset really going to still be something that you want 10 years from now? Is it going to be economically viable 10 years from now? Or is it going to be undercut by the ever dropping price of renewables? But I'd also say that while we are pursuing good technology, there are a lot of not so sexy problems in India which do need solving. Our electricity supply companies are in debt yeah. right? because they're not charging enough from consumers. So as the prices go down, they should still think of price rationalization, you know, asking rich consumers to at least pay up for what they're using or pay a little more to manage yeah. some of the externalities. Right? So I completely agree with you, but I think there's some of these other things that we just have to fix ourselves and right. we know what needs to be done. I totally agree. The design of electricity markets is very important. You know, in the U.S., uh, rural electrification of even the countryside in the U.S. did not make economic sense on paper. And the only way it was done, and this was in the, the early 1900s, was uh, sort of a national effort to do so that put the price tag for doing so on the heads of city dwellers who really paid a little extra right. to have that grid built out. But the net effect was a huge positive for the nation. So I think India has to figure out how to do that sort of thing as well. So I have a sort of a newbie question here. I don't really know much about energy or the technical aspects of this. But supposing I, as a consumer, right now, if I don't have power at home, I'm dependent on the government. They're the sole provider of power to me. But if I so want, has a te- is the technology going to reach the stage where I can just set up my own solar power unit at home and power myself and it'll be cheaper than what the government can give me? Or does that require scale? So we talk about uh, two different sorts of things. One is unplugging from the grid, grid defection. Uh, And I don't think we're going to see a lot of grid defection. I do think we'll see uh, grid reduced dependence. So if you look at the math, I'll give you an example from another country, Germany. Germany gets half the sunlight per square meter as India. In Germany, the math says that a home with a small solar panel uh, or a small array and a small battery, half the size of the Tesla Powerwall, can provide 70% of its own electricity in the summer months. Now, 70%, you're not, that's not satisfactory. You want 99% uptime when you hit the lights on. Right. But it's getting technically easier to go off-grid if you really want to. But once people have electricity, they want more. And they want to just know they can turn on the lights at any time and it will always work. So the grid's not going to go away. Because the sort of local problem in India is that you're talking about 70%. To most people, 70% electricity in a day is a lot. They'd be very happy with it. And what people do is because the government fails to provide power the way they should, you have people doing what we call jugar, just managing on their own, using generators, which are way more expensive than, for example, I imagine solar technology would be. 
so in one sense i if governments fail to keep pace is it also then a tool of empowerment for individuals and local communities who can uh, provide for their own power themselves it absolutely is uh, for uh, an urban dweller who is moderate or high income it's a way to provide backup against the grid with a battery or with solar and for villages that have not had electrification solar on their rooftops is not the ultimate solution but it's a great way if you can provide four hours of light and electricity after sunset you can have kids studying for school you can charge your devices you can watch television and be part of the modern world you can use your tablet so that's a gigantic change and then eventually uh, that village might do it for themselves or that individual homeowner might do it for themselves but eventually the grid has to get better as well so um ramesh we'll uh, take a couple of steps back clearly this technological disruption that is happening in the energy field is big which means that we are doing something right so how what is that something that the world is doing right and how do we do more of it oh goodness well there's two things really one is in many different technologies we see what we think of as the learning curve or learning by doing it was really noticed in world war 2 when uh the US military hired economists to study military production right. and some of these economists saw that when you were making the same aircraft again and again your cost per aircraft just dropped because you got better and better the workers got more skilled they learned how to uh save energy save materials and so on so that applies to all industries almost it happens to apply to industries where you are uh miniaturizing or using less and less better than it does to sort of high scale but the second thing is you know i have a slight libertarian bent in my view on economics and i used to think that uh subsidies in solar made no sense but what you actually have is if you go back to uh 1990 let's say the german people again germany has the same sunshine as alaska it's so it's half the sunshine you know per unit area of uh india or maybe even slightly less the german people decided they wanted to go solar that made no sense whatsoever and i tell german people this all the time they should have built solar in spain and built a power grid but they decided they wanted to go solar so they put these huge subsidies and those subsidies which are now mostly gone those subsidies bootstrapped the industry let the industry scale that created learning by doing let private companies and reinvest some of those dollars into r&d and that improved the technology so solar is so cheap now because the germans did something very inefficient 20 years ago the big effect of their subsidies was not the amount of solar they deployed the big effect was how much it dropped the price for everyone who followed so the pain that germany inflicted on itself fiscally is helping all of us now in the future including germans including germans yes which i think pavan goes back to your earlier question about should our government then just free roll you know why why should we uh, sort of uh, yeah, so, uh, spend resources in innovating ourselves when the rest of the world is doing that and we can yeah, just so free roll yeah. how would you say india should be thinking of this should we just coast on innovation happening outside the world which seems like the easy option or should we do something else yeah it is an easy option so a i'd say India should never turn its back on innovation happening across the world. One, if we start to talk about how can India build a bigger solar industry, an obvious answer someone could say is we'll put tariffs on imported Chinese panels so we can build one ourselves. No, that's just shooting yourself in the foot in multiple right. ways, right? So you should embrace what's out there. Um, but you can think about how do you bootstrap it even more innovation internally and that's how do you spend money on R&D can you make grants to scientists to do better work in researching materials how do you have universities funded such that people can do real groundbreaking research how do you make it possible for someone with a new technology to turn it into a startup that could be a, a billion dollar or you know 10 billion rupee business down the road uh Elon Musk what well, came out of IT Elon Musk worked at PayPal he was one of the founders of PayPal and then he went on to found Solar City the biggest residential solar company in the US and Tesla so okay. why can't uh, an IT pioneer in India of whom there are many start the next great uh energy company why isn't the next Tesla going to come out of India and what policies have to change to make that kind of entrepreneurship possible That's a rhetorical question but I'm going to turn it back to you as a real question. 
Well, you need you need a number of things. You need uh, the ease of hiring and firing people if you want to run a startup. You need uh, security for your investors that the rule of law applies and they will get the exit that they are promised and, and something will not be nationalized or the rules won't be changed on them. You need to get rid of barriers, licensing steps, unnecessary requirements, unnecessary inspections that will stifle some small business when it's first starting out. Uh, you need to create enough of a security net that people feel like they can go and take a risk, launch a startup that might fail, and that that's not a bad thing. That if it fails, it's valuable experience for them. It's almost a cultural phenomenon. And actually, Europeans talk about this to me, that in America, it's almost a badge of honor if you've started a startup and it's failed. Whatever. Every Thanks. successful entrepreneur almost has that. In Europe, it's a no-no. And in India, I see a lot of entrepreneurial small business people, but how does it look if you try to launch a big business and it failed? Is that acceptable or not acceptable? That The difference between those two is the difference between whether or not you have a lot of entrepreneurs or not. So, you know, again, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to my earlier chain of thought where, you know, being a libertarian, I don't trust the government to get anything right. So is there a market opportunity here because solar is so cheap and so much of India doesn't have power? Is there a market opportunity for a local entrepreneur to embrace this technology and actually create units which can be used at the individual home or community level, which are actually affordable? So, you know, to ask a practical question, therefore, how much would it cost me to set up such a unit at my home right now? And how far do you see that? price dropping in the future so Indian people can take care of their own energy problems if they have to. Yeah. So it varies. It varies on how much power you want, uh, what your demands are. And then it turns out that a lot of the cost of deploying solar at a single home scale is not the technology. It is the cost of the labor to put it on your roof. It's the cost of wiring it to your house. And in America, it's often the cost of the inspections that you have to get. And I, I imagine, I'm not having done this in India, that some of the costs will be those inspections and maybe a little extra. They have to pay those inspectors to make it all okay. Uh, but the technology itself, you know, for uh, $2,000 US, you could have one kilowatt of power on your roof and a small battery that would store an hour or two of that. And that would be a really good backup against the grid. And on top of that, the labor cost and so on. And you see that uh, price dropping as uh, the years go by. Obviously. That price will keep dropping, especially the storage part. So right. storage is dropping in price exponentially. And storage is roughly where solar was 10 or 15 years ago. So I think we'll see the storage part especially drop rapidly. So for many Indian households, it may even be, if they're already in the grid, that solar is not the main thing they want, is they want a battery to fill up when the grid is working and then be able to switch to it automatically when the grid is not. While I sort of broadly agree with those libertarian tendencies, I think the, the challenge in India will always be not allowing the government to get an alibi. That's a so point. one of the things is, uh, be it electricity, water supply, all of these things are huge coping costs that every Indian uh, citizen or consumer has. Um, you know, they have their own backups, they have their own inverters to store uh, electricity and then make it into alternating current again. So all these things that people do, they have their own underground uh, tanks of where they have their own pumps so i think the risk with uh, sort of promoting a narrative which says hey let's all be self sufficient is the government also says all right i'm game for that too you guys all be self sufficient i mean yeah. the story of india really is that look if the government won't look after us we got to look after ourselves that's you know we grow despite the government so that's um, true. you know i i just see if if solar energy is really getting so cheap and we desperately need energy and the government can't get the job done then there's an opportunity here so if you if you're listening to this podcast and you're an entrepreneur especially a failed entrepreneur which is a good thing <laughs> in our view then you really have to get into this I want to ask one final question, um, uh, and this is a little bit of a detail, but Indian startups seem to be great whenever they don't have to deal with real-world products. Mm. You know, I mean, when you're dealing, dealing with software, when you're dealing with bits and bytes, we're very good. So the barriers that and concerns that you raised about, you know, the ease of doing business, you know, you owning your own intellectual property, uh, and so on, by and large, I think we've gotten it right if you're dealing with software. But the moment it, you come to hardware and manufacturing, the supply chains are a mess, the public goods that are required, infrastructure and so on are not there. So the electricity supply you might need in your 
company which is doing solar innovation may not be good enough for you to do your job well yeah you know so i think that will be the big concern so any general thoughts on how supply chains are working in the space in the us i mean a i'll say in the us hardware startups are also much harder than software startups that's just okay. a phenomenon of what they are the these startup costs are much higher the margins are much lower there's fewer network effects so that's something of that is a universal issue but i will say you know this is my first time in india but i spent a fair bit of time in china and china simply made a decision to get its infrastructure done and they overdid it they built a lot of infrastructure that's useless right. but they did universal electrification they built roads so goods could move to the factories and back uh and they just did it sort of by force of power and they did not accept any excuses the first time i was in china in 2000 one of the articles in the newspaper was about someone a governor actually being arrested and executed for corruption and in china actually it's okay to be corrupt in the sense of making money off of your position it's not okay to be corrupt in terms of stopping the right things from happening and so i i think india has to get maybe not that ruthless <laughs> but it has to be about just get the job done and some of that has to be done by the state my solution to everything is off with their heads that's the only thing that works if you enjoyed this conversation do go to ramesnam.com which is ramesh's website to check out the nexus trilogy which is an award winning science fiction trilogy which came out a couple of years ago and for more on his thoughts about energy uh, do read his book the infinite resource ramesh thank you so much for being on the show thank you so much guys and let's grab coffee I don't need coffee ramens. Let's go take a walk in the sun. <laughs> Good evening ladies and gentlemen this is your captain speaking sorry to say but there's been a slight delay due to the apocalypse having suddenly begun as you can see there's death destruction and chaos taking place all around us but don't you worry food and drinks will be served shortly and i would recommend checking out IVM podcasts to get some of your favorite indian podcasts we'll keep you going till this whole thing blows over thank you